one, this uh, nullifier of wudu is not common in this country. And it's, it's a rare case in this country, definitely. But for the, obviously, for the completeness of the topic, eating camel meat or any internal part of the camel, you know, heart, you know, whatever that, that can be eaten from the inside of the, of the camel, eating any of that, but obviously it has to be meat, right? Nullifies one's wudu. And this is based on Hadith Jabir ibn Samira, or Samura. أن رجلا سأل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنا توضأ من لحم الغنم قال إن شئت توضأ وإن شئت لا تتوضأ قال أنا توضأ من لحوم الإبل قال نعم توضأ من لحوم الإبل رواه مسلم هي عليه الصلاة والسلام was asked يعني a صحابي asked رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم should I do wudu after eating mutton sheep he said عليه الصلاة والسلام if you wish يعني if you wish you can perform ablution, and if you wish, you don't have to. Then he asked, the person asked, should I do wudu from eating camel meat? He, alayhi salatu wasalam, said yes. So that tells us that a person should renew the wudu after eating uh, camel meat. Now there is a side benefit of this hadith. Who noticed it? A man came to the Prophet وسلم, asked him, What does this tell us? Okay. La, la, the person, the Sahabi, came to the Prophet وسلم, and asked him about if I eat from this meat, should I do wudu? If I eat from that meat, should I do wudu? What can we tell? What, can, what do we learn from this? Confirming with the Prophet. Ahsant. The Sahaba was so interested in learning the religion and making sure that they know the ruling for everything. If they don't know, they come to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Mufti Al-A'zam at the time, right? He is the Mufti. He is the one to be asked. He is the knowledgeable. They would come. If they, if they were ignorant of the hukum, they would come and ask because they don't want to worship Allah Azza wa Jal based on ignorance. They want to learn and to, so that they please Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is how every Muslim should be. If we, if we notice, you know, we've, we've seen this you know, similar example all along all of this halaqa from the very beginning. How many hadith have we seen so far where a sahabi came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him about something? If I do this, is this halal? If I do, what is the hukum for this, right? What do I need to do for, to enter paradise, right? Tell me about something that I can do that Allah Azza wa Jal will admit me into paradise because of it. This is the Sahaba, the best of the nation, the best of the, the best generation. Wallahi, we should do the same thing. How many times do Muslims do things and they don't know what the hukum? You ask them, you know, at work, transaction, relationships, do you know if this is halal? If you are allowed to do this? I don't know. But how do you do if you don't know? How do you do something if you don't know if it is halal or haram? Is it halal for you to do it or not? Is it halal for you to say it or not? How many people do that? Look at the Sahaba. Radiyallahu anhum wa ardahum. Side notes. Notice. Naam. Slide it up. It's battery low. Oh, we should change it, inshallah. Abdullah. Okay, so the question is... Uh, it should probably still work. It's still working? No, I don't think. Because it's red. It's not oh, it's very low? Okay. Khair, inshallah. Because you touched this topic, I want to ask you, uh, there are few ulama and some knowledgeable people out there, and they claim to say that the Sahaba also performed acts without asking Rasulullah and that means it is allowed for us to do bid'ah. Like what? Like for example, uh, you, you had one hadith where uh, one of the Sahabi read Surah Al-Fatiha on a sick person or uh, he was bit by a scorpion or something. Yes. Ruqya. So, so he performed he did, Ruqya. He did Ruqya without right. asking the Prophet. Right. And then, uh, but, but didn't he actually ask the Prophet sallallahu yeah. alaihi wasallam? The reason he didn't do it. Here's why. So uh, let me repeat the question because uh, obviously we have brothers online and we have the sisters up there. 
So the brother is asking, right? Some people say or claim that it is permissible to do things without knowing or without asking because the Sahaba did certain things without asking Rasulullah if it was permissible or not. And they give, they give the example that we actually uh, went over during uh, while we were explaining Tawheed. Remember Ruqya? When we talked about Ruqya, right? And we mentioned the hadith of the, sahab, of the few Sahaba who were uh, uh, traveling, right? And they uh, passed by people right the master of their of, the, of those people was bitten by a scorpion right and they asked any person know how to how to cure him so one of the or ask any person knows the quran so he came and recited surah al-fatiha and that person was cured right now they use this as a uh, as a as a argument the first thing we notice is that obviously the rasulullah was not there and the person was about to die, right? So they actually made a uh, judgment, right? That this is Quran and Allah Azza wa Jal sent it as a cure. He said, Shifa'un lima fi sudur. And indeed it is a shifa, it is a cure physically and spiritually. It is a physical cure as well as it is a spiritual cure, right? But the first thing that they did when they actually came back to the Medina and they came and they uh, met with Rasulullah what did he say? He said, I did this and this. Is that permissible? He said, well, how do you know that Surah Al-Fatiha is a cure? Yes, it is permissible and it is a cure. And they even offered him a reward, you know, certain sheep. And he said, I refuse to take it until I ask Mufti, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, is it permissible to take? He said, yes, it is. And give me one of them. So they actually, when they came back to Rasulullah they asked him, is it permissible or not? And if they, it wasn't, he wouldn't have done it again. So that argument doesn't hold, right? No person should do anything without being sure whether it is permissible or not. And we've went over the hadith in Nu'man ibn Bashir, where Rasulullah Wasallam says, Al-halal ubayyin, wal-haram ubayyin, wa baynahuma umurun mushtabihat. The halal is crystal clear and the haram is crystal clear. And in between them are doubtful matters. And the responsibility for the Muslim with respect to the doubtful matters, what does, what the, what does a doubtful matter mean? It means that I run across something that I don't know the hukum. Is it halal or is it haram? I don't know. Because of ignorance on my side. It becomes doubtful for me. I don't know, right? The, the responsibility of the Muslim is not to do it until such a time when they learn the hukum. If it is halal, then they go ahead for it. If it is haram, then they refrain from it. <coughs> but doing something, especially from ibadah, so, and Rasulullah said, uh, من هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد. And let's, let me finish my answer by saying this. All the scholars have said, uh, the worships, al-ibadat, tawqifiyya. Tawqifiyya means that we should stop. We don't actually invent new acts of worship. We actually look, did Rasulullah legislate that certain type of ibadah? Then we perform it. If not, then we stop from it, refrain from it. We don't invent a new type of ibadah because it is tawqifiyya. Yani we stop at it based on the evidence. Now, okay. Tada. Um, you had mentioned a point where you, you pulled our attention that all the Sahaba were talking to Rasulullah asking each and every question, making it part of the so increasing their knowledge, right? Obviously, we all know he was the Mufti at that time and he was the only person. Today, we have Google, we have a bunch of Muftis around, right? Yes. So, I can give an example. Um, you had mentioned in your videos that uh, uh, for making the wudu, you make a uh, niyyah. Yes. Ha. Right. Or in other words, the heart knows exactly what you're doing, right? So that's your niyyah. Ah. But in this masjid, I have seen in the wudu area, there's a dua return, which says, okay, you know, before you make the wudu, you know, make this dua, right? So, uh, a, you know, illiterate person, perhaps like me, um, saw that, probably read it, or may have got a, a, a you know, thought in my mind that I don't know if I did it right or wrong because I heard something from you also. 
I go to the Mufti who may have authorized that thing over there, right? Yes. So if that Mufti says, yeah, you should do it, then should I follow or should I do more research? Because yeah. here's the clash, because over at that time it's only one person. Yes. Today we have a lot. So uh, people like us are... You know, what should I do? Exactly. Richard. We're falling into, into trap. Excellent question, Barakallah. Wallahi, it couldn't be a better question. And I Zakallahu khairan for that question. And let me start and my answer by saying this. May Allah increase your knowledge. May Allah teach you that which is beneficial. May Allah make you uh, comprehend the religion. Allahumma faqihu fi deen. Ameen, Ameen, Barakallah Fiqh, and to all of us here, and to all Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all Muslims comprehend the religion to worship Allah Azza wa Jal based on, based on basira, based on ilm, uh, uh, not on ignorance. To answer your question, and re real quick to repeat the question so that everybody hears, the brother is saying that, you know, for a normal Muslim who doesn't have a lot of knowledge, right? For example, al wudu we talked about al wudu and we said that the example of the niyyah is that it should be in the heart. It shouldn't be voiced in the tongue, right? But for example, you come into this masjid and many other masajid, most of the masajid actually, you know, and we see that it is written on the wall that you should say such and such before you perform the wudu, right? So what should I do? Right? Even you ask sometimes some muftis, right, called muftis, and they say, yes, I authorize this or you should do this. The first thing that you should ask, Akhi Barakallah Fiqh, tell him, I respect you and I have, I, I bear uh, utmost request, uh, respect to you. But this is a religion. It has nothing to do with you or any person, even me. I respect you, but this is religion. Where's the evidence? Show me the evidence. You're saying I should do that. Show me the evidence. I am entitled to know that religion, to know the evidence on everything, so that when I stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment, I say this is the this is the evidence that I was shown, and I did this based on that. This is a religion; it's not a joke, right? It should always be based on based on evidence. Secondly, we say, what is the meaning of a niyyah? A niyyah is not a speech; it is a determination of the heart. Qasdul qalb wa iradatihi. This is in the Arabic language. The definition of a niyyah is qasdul qalb, the determination of the heart and its intention. So, whatever the heart intends is the intention. A lot of us, let me give you an example. A lot of us sometimes in the middle of the busy day, right? We're so busy, we're so occupied with work and, you know, uh, thinking about, you know, problems at work, at home, maybe, you know, problems with our kids, or we're, you know, we're thinking, we're cons consumed in our thoughts about the different problems. If I come to the wudu area, and I just say with my tongue that I am making a wudu for Salat al-Dhuhr, and my heart is somewhere else, it's not even thinking about it. I'm thinking about the problem with my manager. Is that a niyyah? How useful is that niyyah? How meaningful is that niyyah? I can tell you, some of the scholars have actually said it is allowed to say the niya in your tongue. But even those who said so, including Imam Shafi'i, they said, unless the heart recognizes that niya, what you say in the tongue is meaningless, is worthless. So, what is most important is what your heart recognizes. And if you say something in your tongue and your heart doesn't mean it, it's not a niya. So like I said, we should ask, where is the evidence? Barakallah fiqh. This is a religion. And I, this is my religion. And I am responsible in front of Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment. If you tell me something, you're not going to be responsible for me. You are responsible for your deeds. And I am responsible for my deeds. So that is why I am entitled to know what the, what the evidence. And this is, ya akhwan, let me finish by this. This is what we talked about before. The reason we are going through the evidences, to be frank with you, a lot of what we cover, right, is actually very common knowledge. I mean, who doesn't know that you need, a, you require a wudu before the prayer? It's hard, it's يعني, inconceivable to think of a Muslim who doesn't know that. And yet we gave so many example, uh, evidences, I'm sorry about that. Re the reason I do this is because I want you to be able to worship Allah Azza wa Jal based on basira and evidence. I don't want you to attach to me in, per, in particular. Don't think that Brother Kamil, and I, res, and I appreciate your respect and I appreciate your, uh, you know, uh, your confidence in me, but I want you to attach to what is haq and the evidence. I am no, in no way synonymous to haq. 
I'm a human being. I make mistakes. Sometimes I may tell you something and I may, may actually contradict it in my deeds. I am not the haq. Respect me as much as I actually follow the haq. You see what I'm going, where I'm going? So if I tell you something ever without evidence, say, Brother Kamil, we respect you, but this is a religion. Where did you get this from? You are entitled to it. I am not, I don't actually feel, you know, dishonored by you asking me. On the contrary, wallahi, that, that brings me pleasure. Because I am not here to get you my opinion or my own thought and, 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 and uh, inclination. I want you to get to the haq based on the evidence. We do this because Rasulullah sallallahu such said such and such. And Allah azza wa jal said such and such. This is the evidence. I may have an opinion. The mufti such and such may have an opinion. Sheikh Fulani may have an opinion. I am not interested in the opinions. I am interested in the haq that is based on evidence. This is what I'm interested in. Right? Now. Does that answer the question or is there? Well, I think I'm, I'm taking my question to a different level, but I don't want to consume time. With sure. Inshallah. Maybe inshallah, if you yeah. want, we can continue a little bit after Aisha. So just quickly, can you open anything? So you were giving examples from Sunan Abu Dawan, Ibn Majah, etc. No. So he has been judged Sahih by Shaykh al So who are the authorities to judge it? I'm sorry, who are the? If sorry. someone comes and says this is from Ibn Majah. No. Right? Who can judge it, whether it's Sahih or Ahsan or whether it's Sahih? Oh, the scholars of Hadith. So, you know, the, the, the knowledge of Islam have actually evolved so much. And they are so specific that after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, especially with the beginning of the four main imma, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, Imam Malik rahimahullah, Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala, and all the rest of the imma al-Islam. They actually divided the knowledge into multiple types. And that is for a good reason because it became so much overwhelming. Now we have ulum al-Quran, we have ulum al-Sunnah, we have even now, okay, you know, Islam spread so much and people started to narrate the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu It is conceivable that some people are liars. They might lie. They say Rasulullah such and said such and such and he never said that. How do we know if this is a hadith sahih? How do we feel comfortable that really Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said such, such, said such and such? So the knowledge or the ilm we call ilm al-rijal, right, emerged, which is the science of studying the man which are the men in the chain of the narration of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. There are scholars of hadith, and these are ulama al-hadith, who actually studied, and actually there are books, for example, Seer al-A'lam wa nubala al-Imam al-Zahabi, right? That is a, not, not يعني, it's not a uh, biography, but this is maybe for the lack of the better term, you know, maybe you can call it a biography of the man who appear in the chains of the hadith. So, for example, we have we you know we have the biography of Ibn Mas'ud, we have the uh, biography of uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah, we have the biography of Ibn Abbas, you know Mujahid, etc., uh, etc. Et right? All of the people who appear in Nu'man ibn Bashir, Abu Sa'id al Khudri, etc. Right? So that we know from their stories who is trustworthy, who never lied, who sometimes lie, who never lies, but his memory is not perfect. So sometimes he may err. Right? He may say, I heard Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said this and this, but it's not an intentional lie, but it is wrong. Right? And this is what determines a hadith sahih. Hadith sahih, real quick, you know, obviously the time is running out. But for example, a hadith sahih is the hadith that all the chain... Ten, ten. ten minutes? No, no, ten, ten. Oh, the ten, ten. So we have, okay, we have still some time. So a hadith sahih is the hadith whose chain of narration, Sanad, all the men in it, right, are trust, trustworthy people, right, with sound memory. If one person in the chain is, is not a trustworthy, it, you know, he was witnessed, you know, telling a lie or, cheat or, or you, know, uh, you know, cheating, even on an animal, then he is not a trustworthy person. That degrades the grade of the, of the hadith. If there is a person in the chain whose memory is, yani sometimes may fail him, 
that become that hadith becomes a hasan, right? A lesser grade, right? Sometimes the hadith may actually strengthen one another. Sometimes, you know, you know, for example, in a specific topic, you will find a lot of hadith that are weak, but not too weak. Yani the weakness is not severe weakness, right? There's somewhat, there is weakness in the in the Senate. But there are so many. You know, for example, 20 hadith in that topic. They may actually strengthen one another, and because of the abundance of all of these hadith, they may actually raise the, the grade of the hadith to reach the hasan, etc., etc. So believe me, we can actually actually rest assured. Wallillah alhamdu wal minna. And you cannot find anything similar close to it in any other religion, right? We can be very comfortable and we can be very uh, yani confident. We can be very confident that if a hadith is sahih, then we have absolutely beyond doubt that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it. No doubt. Now, science of hadith. So they judge, right? So when we say, for example, Imam Al-Albani, Imam Al-Albani Al -Albani, Al -Albani is one of the A'immat Al-Hadith. He spent decades of his, uh, you know, uh, lifetime, right? Studying the hadith, studying the, the chains of the, uh, of the hadith, the Sanad, right? And looking their biographies to judge whether this hadith, for example, obviously we know Sahih Muslim and Sahih Al-Bukhari are Sahih. No question about it. We don't, know, we don't need to go any further. Because they set their goal to only gather and collect al hadith al sahih sound hadith. But for example, Sunan al Tirmidhi, Sunan al Nasai, Sunan Abi Dawood, Sunan al uh, Ibn Majah, right? They did not necessarily choose only the sound hadith. Some of them may be Hassan, some of them may be even weak, right? So they required somebody to come afterward and study these hadith and judge them, grade them. Hadith sahih, hadith Hassan, hadith da'if, mawdu', right? Uh, uh, fabricated hadith, etc. So when we say that, you know, we say uh, the hadith and we say the grade and the scholar who actually graded, then alhamdulillah, and you can always go back to the, uh, to, the, yani, to the book where we said he graded as hadith, right? For example, Imam al-Albani, he has what's called a silsil al-sahihah and a silsil al-da'ifa, you know, the, the book that collects all the hadith that are sahih, that he said they are sahih. You can go back and check and verify. Alhamdulillah, no problem. Nah. Not, not only Sheikh Al Albani, there are other muhaddithin, muhaddith or scholar of hadith. And you know, some of them are actually from, you know, from the righteous ancestors. You know, obviously, Imam Al Albani is a contemporary. Now he passed away, but he was, uh, yani he didn't pass away too long ago, right? He's a contemporary muhaddith, but there are even from before, right? There are a lot of muhaddithin, and uh, very rare do you find any dispute. Yani if they judge this hadith as hasan or sahih, then in general, most of them, they agree to that. Yani only in few instances where they may, may have disagreement. But if you notice, for example, in all the evidences that we've always given, We've always built it based on either hadith has, uh, sahih or hasan. We never use weak hadith. Why? Because alhamdulillah we have enough in the sahih and the hasan that we don't need to go to the da'if, the weak or the very weak. We have no need for that alhamdulillah. We have plenty of hadith sahih and hasan that we can bring the evidence to everything that we talk about. Now, uh, so one of the, so there are some questions from the sisters. When nose uh, bleeds, do you lose 